thank you for everyone who's joined so far. Um, my name is Simon Clark. I'm EGU's uh, program coordinator, and today I'll be hosting this webinar on preprints to public peer review: How to engage with EGU Sphere. We'll be talking about what is EGU Sphere and how to take advantage of the preprints um, and the platform's public peer review processes, amongst other things. To help us with this, we have three guest speakers, uh, Suzanne Vita, the EGU Sphere Coordinator, Barbara Evans, the EGU Publications Committee Chair, Martin Rasmussen, Managed Director of Copernicus, EGU's publishing partner. The webinar will be recorded at a later date on YouTube, so please give an out for that. And the webinar itself will finish with a Q&A section. So if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box at the bottom and upvote any questions you think are pertinent. Um, and with that, I'll pass on to our first speaker, which is Suzanne. Hey, Suzanne. Thanks a lot, Simon. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. So let me share the screen. Sorry, I hope that that's all clear and that you hear me clearly. And so we're very happy with this opportunity um, to, to discuss EGU Sphere. So EGU Sphere is what we call the Innovative Open Access Repository, um, and it's created by the EGU and, and by Copernicus Publications. So an EGU Sphere didn't just come about this year. Um, we were already hosting um, abstracts and conference presentations, um, but as of a few weeks, we we're also open for preprints. So. We therefore thought that um, a webinar on how to engage with EGU Sphere would be very timely. Um, and what we will be discussing, I will, we will have three speakers, um, I will be kicking off with what are actually preprints, what is EGU Sphere, um, and why did we start another preprint server? Um, and Barbara will follow up with the, the routes that exist, the different options on, on EGU Sphere, and the relation between um, the preprints on EGU Sphere preprint server and, and the journals of, of EGU. Whereas Martin will show you how this actually really works in practice. How can you upload a preprint? Um, what, what are the, uh, how can you become a preprint screening moderator? I will be explaining what that is. Um, and how EGU Sphere combines both the conferences and, and the presentation materials on the one end and, and the preprints on and the manuscripts on the other. And we'll make sure that we have time for presentation and for questions. So we will um, we'll keep on, on, on track. So what are preprints? Um, it's what the word says. It's, it's the version of a manuscript before, so preprint, meaning before peer review and before publication. Mm -hmm. So most publishers, for example, they, they allow you to post a preprint version of your manuscript on your own website. And most publishers also allow that you post a preprint version of your manuscript on a so-called um, preprint server. But preprints can also be standalone. Um, you, do, you, you might have a manuscript or an idea that you would like to get out there, but you're not yet targeting publication in general, maybe not at all. Um, and then you can post that preprint on, on a preprint server. Now, what are the reasons to preprints? There, there's actually many, um, but an, an important one is that preprints are available to anyone. You don't have to pay to post your preprint. You don't pay to read them. And that makes the research um, that, that is communicated in a preprint very accessible. You also don't have to, to, to wait for your manuscript to, to be made public until it has been peer reviewed and you revised it and it's been copy edited and that process can take several months. But instead of preprint is posted um, quickly. And that also helps with the transparency of the research process because it means that um, ideas are posted quickly. And so it, it becomes clear um, who did what and when. So you can, you can track um, the progress in, in the research. Um, manuscripts usually also receive a DOI, so they can be cited. Um, and you can get feedback in an early stage on the manuscript, you, not only from, from your reviewers, but already in an early stage, the community can comment on your preprint and, and authors can reply to these comments. Um, so, so these arguments all highlight um, in that, that um, the preprints as, as a manner of a communication manner that, that is open, um, and transparent 
um, and accessible and constructive, I would say. Now, now preprints is not something that is new. They, they have been around for quite a while, um, as have preprint servers. Uh, and and uh, probably the best one that is known is Archive. That's um, it's already from 1991, so a good 30 years. Um, and they have over 2 million manuscripts. But just the last years have seen some preprint servers emerging in, in the earth and the space sciences. So there's Earth Archive. They will be celebrating their five years um, this autumn. Um, but also Iswa from our colleagues at HU from 2018. They're linked to the publisher Wiley, whereas Archive and Earth Archive are, are standalone preprint servers. Um, and then, of course, EDU Sphere open since 2020 for abstracts and conference presentations and as of a few weeks also for preprints. So three out of the four preprint servers that I've listed here are fairly young. And, and this indicates that there is um, a growing interest um, from, from auditors to um, communicate their science in an open access manner. So EGCM, um, we have abstracts um, and conference presentation materials, as I said, since 2020. Um, 2020, because that was the year that um, we went online with um, the General Assembly at the start of the pandemic in, in a few weeks' time. Um, and we decided that we post um, the abstracts with the DOI so they can be cited, but linked to this, um, the presentation materials. And that could be slides from, from a PowerPoint, or it can be the, the PDF of a poster, or, or a PDF of anything you would like to share with the abstract. And it's linked to the abstract. EG Sphere also has backward abstracts to 2015, um, all from conferences that are linked to, to EDU, but these don't have a DOI. Okay. Now, as of 7 February, we're open for preprints. And, and I've just shown you that there are already several preprint servers, right? So you might be wondering, why did EDU start another preprint server? Okay. Now, it's first and mainly because EDU supports open access. Um, and, and it aims to, to, to contribute to increase in the visibility of your research. Um, a very pragmatic point is also that um, the journals of EG were already posting the submitted version of manuscripts online. So in the sense that these are also preprints, but these preprints are distributed over the, the, the 19 open access journals of, of EG. And EG Sphere brings all these preprints together in, in one platform. And Barbara will be telling more about the, the relationship between the preprints on EGU Sphere and, and the journals. So one thing that I, I would like to emphasize is that um, we strongly support the, the, the Earth Science and Space Science preprint community. Um, so we, we share the goal of, of making um, the, the, the research accessible and, and available in an open manner. Um, so I would say it's um, we welcome the collaboration. I wouldn't see this as, as a competition. In, in the sense, it's the more the merrier. And, and in, in, in the spirit of this collaboration, um, an example is that, um, for example, external preprints, say you have your manuscript on archive or Earth, Ar Earth archive, um, you can join EDU Sphere if you would wish to be considered for publication in an EDU journal. And then you go into review with an EDU journal while your preprint is on another preprint server. So that's an example of, um, the collaboration that, that, that we seek um, among the different preprint servers. Um, and at the same time, any preprint that comes in, they, they benefit from the, the, the open discussion and feedback um, that, that the, the publications of, of, of each you have. Um, so what's the philosophy of EDU Sphere? Um, as I mentioned, it's a community service. We would, we would like to help the authors increase the visibility of their research. Um, there's also an encouragement of collaboration by the open and transparent sharing, um, which, which is also helped because yeah, you post your idea out there very early um, and you can get early feedback to open community discussion. Anybody can post a comment um, and the authors can reply and you, you can have a discussion that is then posted online. Um, the manuscripts are findable, they're citable, they have a DOI. It does mean your preprint has a different DOI in your final version, but they're linked. 
And we hope to engage the community with the publication process. And I'm very proud I posted here on the slides uh, the first preprint that was up on, on EDU Sphere and already on 18 February. Now, how can you become engaged? Of course, we would love you to, to submit your manuscript as a preprint. Right? But please also go and, and see if you can comment on posted preprints. And you can uh, consider to become a so called preprint moderator. Now, what is this? These are these preprints that are standalone. Right? So, manuscripts that would like to get an idea out there, um, but they're not targeting publication in the journal, maybe not yet. Right? And these preprints are screened to make sure that it's a basic standard of science quality, conventional standards of civil discourse, and that they're not abusive. Right? Now, we're very happy that we already got 37 preprint screening moderators. But we would love more moderators to join us. And, and Marta will be showing you um, how you can apply to become a pre screen moderator. Okay, so I hope that, give, that gives you some initial flavor and idea of, of what EDU Sphere is about, what preprints is about, why, why have we come up with a pre print um, server. Um, and with that, I would like to hand over to Barbara. Yeah, um, so I will actually continue um, and, and show you where you can find the information on the different types of preprint um, options that are possible on EDU Sphere. So this is a website um, you, you can find under EDU Sphere on um, preprints and options. And as Susanna said, we have basically three different options for preprints in EDU Sphere. So these are the preprints aimed at publication in an EDU journal. Then preprints that um, target not immediate journal publication and external preprints. So I will step you now through um, the different um, submission pathways and the different steps um, these different preprints will undergo. So um, for more than 20 years, we have the journals um, in EDU with an open and interactive discussion before the um, papers are actually accepted by um, accepted for publication. So this is shown here. So, um, so far, authors could submit their manuscripts to a journal, to one of the 19 EDU journals. And then this um, manuscript um, was sent out to editor calls or an editor was assigned to handle the review process. So all the um, preprints or the um, papers underwent a quick access review just to check the um, basic scientific standards and um, the suitability for this journal. And um, this could also happen already with um, the help of reviewers, peer reviewers. So if the editor decided that the paper um, could be posted in, um, in the discussion forum, then um, the paper was um, posted there in the discussion for several weeks, uh, the exact length de depends on the journal, but um, it's it's for several weeks, and then everyone could um, could comment on this preliminary um, manuscript. So it received um, review comments, which could be anonymous or not. So it underwent a full peer review, but also the authors could um, comment already or respond to these review comments. The editor could make comments, but also the community. So anyone could comment on this paper and um, ask questions or ask for clarifications or bring up new ideas. So after this discussion phase, the authors um, have the possibility to revise their manuscript and um, to submit a revised version. And finally, the editor will make a decision whether it um, can be published in, in the journal it was targeted for. So. This um, pathway actually has been in place for 20 years now for some of our journals. And it's, it really stimulates the open discussion and the transparent peer review. So now we also um, apply the same for EDU Sphere. So um, authors can decide whether they want to post um, their preliminary manuscripts um, only on the journal website or whether they want to submit it through EGU Sphere with the idea of a final journal publication. So what is the difference? Well, if they submit through EGU Sphere, 
then the paper is posted both on EGU Sphere and also cross-linked to the journal website. So it has a higher visibility because both the um, people who look at EGU Sphere and search the, the full preprint server will find the paper, but also um, the readers of the journal will find it. And also, um, the, another difference is that these manuscripts will have different DOIs. And so if something is, is submitted through the journal website, um, it will receive a DOI um, which has the name of the journal in it. And that um, caused problems in the past because some publishers are not really familiar with the idea of preprinting and rejected then on papers that were in discussion and rejected afterwards. And because they considered that a journal publication. If it has a DOI, including only EGU sphere, that is a neutral DOI. It's just a preprint server. And most publishers accept these days that preprints can be submitted to their journal. So there should be, um, this problem should be solved by um, submitting through EGU sphere. So it has advantages, not only higher visibility, but also any problems with other publishers that are not up to the idea of um, preprints should be solved by this. So these are the preprints um, targeting um, journal publication. However, we also um, have other preprints, as Susanna said. So if you just have a manuscript um, and with an idea, but it's not quite ready for journal publication yet, and you just want to get the idea out, um, that's what we call preprints, not immediately targeting journal publication. So they can be submitted to EDU Sphere, and they are not handled by journal editors because they do not have a journal relation. But as soon as an, um, such a preprint is submitted, an e the EDU Sphere moderators are called, and depending on their subject area, they receive the calls. Um, specific to this preprint. So the EGU sphere moderators are mostly early career scientists. And this is a role for them, which is not um, quite as high in responsibility as a journal editor, because their role is to screen these uh, preprints for the basic scientific um, quality. And if they give their okay, these preprints are then posted on the um, on, on EGU sphere and stay there for six months where everyone can comment. So the moderators do not have the role to find reviewers and to guide the peer review process like an editor in our journals, but they make sure that the um, preprints that are posted on EGU sphere are scientifically solid. So if the authors decide now that they want to um, target journal publication of their preprints um, during these six months or after these six months, it's possible. So they can decide they um, rather want to seek publication in one of the EGU journals. And that would mean that they basically start the progress I just described above. So they basically submit their preprint to one of the EGU journals, where it then undergoes the editor calls and full peer review. Or they can, of course, go to any other um, journal uh, and just um, the preprint remains on um, EGU sphere, but then might, might be published in another journal. So now the third um, option are external preprints seeking publication in an EGU journal. So as Susanna said, there are um, several other preprint servers out there. Um, that are more and more used. And on uh, such preprint servers, um, preprints typically receive a DOI. And so if authors now want to decide that such preprints should be published eventually, eventually in an EGU journal, they can link these preprints to our um, to EGU sphere. And then this manuscript is treated like any other manuscript that seeks journal publication. So it goes again through the editor calls and receives a full peer review, 
during the open discussion where everyone again can comment on, um, on these papers. And then um, the editor makes a decision finally on whether it can be published or not. So of course that is um, also possible, that was possible also up to now, but now um, the final publication will be linked to the initial preprint that we have basically the same picture as um, any preprint, the connection to any preprint um, that was also submitted to EDU Sphere. And then um, with this pathway, not targeting immediate journal publication and then convert it into one of those. So the idea here for the last type of preprints is really that we want to rec recognize and collaborate with the other preprint servers and really stimulate also the um, connection between preprints and the final journal publication, but also allow just having preprints that do not have to um, be aimed at journal publication um, from the beginning. So these three options um, are the new preprint options. And I think Martin will now de describe how to really submit papers and how it will look like on the website. Thank you very much, Barbara. Yeah, welcome everybody also from my side. Um, great pleasure that we have this webinar and I hope that we can spark your interest for Aegisphere today. Uh, let me share my screen um, for a quick walkthrough. Um, not, of course, the whole system. So this is the landing page of Aegisphere, aegisphere.net. Um, and on this web, uh, website, uh, you might have a look also a bit on the motivations here and what we do. Um, when you uh, aim to submit a preprint, let's let's go through this uh, box here. Um, then the first thing, of course, since I'm already on Aegisphere, so the system knows, ah, okay, you really want to have your preprint on Aegisphere. Um, we come to the journal relations later. Um, then, of course, at the moment, today, it asks you for two roads. Actually, the third road, the external preprint, uh, will be launched tomorrow. So. If we had the, the webinar uh, a few days later, I could have even shown you this. For the time being, I just kindly ask you to believe me. Um, so at the moment, what it asks you is, should your preprint be peer reviewed? Because that's that's the main, main thing. Um, and it says here two options, preprint with public peer review and possible journal publication or preprint with screening only. And let's say for the time being, we say preprint with screening only and proceed. Then it says, okay, I, I need uh, Aegis here topics from you and you have to select uh, at least two. Let's say I, I, I take uh, three topics from Biogeosciences. Um, we also have an, um, a web page on Aegisphere where this is also linked. Um, so what you see here is we have the uh, main domains. They are based on the divisions and the general assembly program groups being um, available in EGU, in EGU um, with, of course, some additions like transdisciplinary topics, which become more and more of an issue. You have seen it, especially during COVID. Um, and if I'm, for example, in the biogeosciences and I take three of these uh, topics, um, then now the the platform knows um, which moderators it should call because since i have selected that i have a preprint without a journal relation without full peer review for a journal um, it is a screening process by the aegisphere moderators and not by any journal editors very important so uh, because the screening of course for a preprint is a very quick and much more easier thing um, than of course an access review if you seek a journal publication um, the rest of the form is in principle like we have it uh, for any other titles with title authors, of course, um, competing interests is a very important thing. So some uh, publishing ethics, um, some information you can leave, and of course, lots of terms and conditions um, you have to agree to. But that's it in principle, because um, the system must only have a chance to call the correct or matching moderators. And of course, um, we need to clarify some legal issues. And if you then submit, then the system will ask you to upload your preprint PDF, and then it looks for a moderator. And the moderator 
um, uh, have very strict deadlines, much stricter deadlines than journal editors, for example, because we want to have it very quick. Um, if I use the same form, but I select that I want to go the first road, so preprints with public query and possible journal publication, it is a bit different because it says, first also, please give me some topics of Aegisphere. Now, of course, the Aegisphere topics are not needed to call anyone. But it's important because since uh, Aegisphere is a fully, fully integrated platform, in the end, we want to link everything together. Preprints with journal relation, without journal relation, abstracts, general assembly presentations, all share the same set of Aegisphere topics. That's a good thing. So let's say I take the same topics here of biogeosciences and I proceed, then it says, since it now knows that I seek a publication in journal, it says, okay, but in which journal? Um, and then I have here all the EGU journals. And let's say I'm also interested in biogeosciences and I say proceed. Now in principle, the form from here on is almost 100% the classical BG um, submission form. Why? Because now it becomes important, for example, let's look into the journal subject areas. I have already the Aegisphere topics, but since I seek publication in BG for the BG review process, the system must call BG editors. So therefore I have to go through the first choice selection and the second so choice selection of uh, biogeosciences. The same would have been if I said I want to be connected to ACP or to CP or any other journal. Um, and then the rest, of course, is also a bit more um, because when it comes to full journal articles, and that is what I'm aiming for, then of course, it's also about how the research is funded, APC payment information. You have seen that these kind of things were not asked for preprints without journal relation. Why? Because preprints without any journal relation with a simple screening process and then an online posting and discussion are free of charge. That is a service that EGU provides to the community as a complementary service. So these are the two roads. If I go through EGU's fear, and from tomorrow on, there's the third road with the external preprints, as Barbara said, where I give the DOI of my preprint sitting on an, another preprint server where I use Aegisphere as my uh, uh, partner to have a public discussion and then maybe a later journal publication. But of course, the idea was from the beginning to make it as easy and comfortable as possible for those people who have published with EGU in public peer review and open access journals for more than 20 years. So if I'm in ACP, largest journal of EGU, and I'm on the submission page and I say, okay, yes, I want to register my manuscript. It now says, okay, you want to go to ACP, that's clear. But where should your preprint be posted and discussed? Uh, discussed if, of course, uh, passing the access review. And then you have the options EGISphere or ACP discussions. And the ACP discussions option, that is what, what uh, Barbara was referring to. That's the one where the first preprint was, public, uh, was posted on the 3rd of September, 2001. So more than 20 years ago. Um, but I can then say, I want to go to Aegisphere. And if I go to Aegisphere and I proceed, then I'm in Aegisphere. But now the system already knows that I have this relation to atmospheric chemistry and physics. So therefore, um, I can now select my topics. Let's say I'm still in biogeosciences for whatever reason. Um, and then I proceed and then I have my preprint registration for peer review in ACP. Uh, so these are the different roads um, when I submit. So that means, um, and that's the first point, which is very important, people must not go through Aegisphere in a way that they uh, have a bookmark on egosphere.net. Yeah? They can stay in their journal as they have done for the last 20 years. So it's a very silent thing. So let's assume I um, have my preprint submitted and I select the relation to ACP. So not egosphere moderators are called for a simple screening process, but instead ACP editors are called based on the ACP subject areas. They look onto my preprint, they found it reasonable, and they are accepted for preprint posting. Since it is an Aegisphere preprint, it will appear, of course, mainly and bibliographically correct on Aegisphere. 
We take an example here, this one, um, from these colleagues. Um, it was posted on the 28th of February. It is, it is discussion. The discussion is open because it was just posted. And here you see, here you see the citation. The original source of this preprint is EGSphere. And the DOI is an EGSphere DOI. Since I'm on EGSphere, it's relatively clear why all these preprints here have an EGSphere um, DOI and an EGSphere citation, because we are simply on the recently posted page of EGSphere. But the good thing is that also here, we promise that those people who are very familiar and feel very comfortable inside the EG journals, they must not worry. These colleagues here have submitted to ACP and they selected EGSphere as their source of a preprint. When I now go to ACP and I go to the recent papers page, I have to scroll a bit down because ACP is really publishing a lot. Um, and I'm here at the 28th of February. Here you see the same preprint. And you see, although I'm in the library, in the online library of ACP, you see that there's an EGSphere, let's say, co-listing. We know this co-listing already, or you might have seen, if journals have inter-journal special issues, where two or more journals collaborate on a special issue. Then you also see this co-listing. And here, for the time being, at the moment, it's an EGSphere preprint, which has a topic selection that fits to ACP. So we find uh, we found it's uh, it's um, it's valuable for the ACP community. Um, and by the way, of course, it has an ACP relation at the moment. Um, so people see it here, and you also see that at the same time, the same day, another preprint was posted, where the authors selected ACP D as their preprint source. So at the moment, we are on a stage, except for Solid Earth, my congratulations to Susanne and her team, because Solid Earth said from the beginning, no, when EGSphere starts, we go 100% EGSphere. All the other 18 EGU journals uh, at the moment um, offer a choice for the authors to go either through EGSphere or through, through the journals discussion forum. For the review process as such, selection of editors, selection of referees, timings, reminders, deadlines, it doesn't matter in principle because um, it all stays the same. It stays with the journal, although it's happening on EGSphere. So let's say it's the best of both worlds. Um, later, we might, or we, it is our goal, on one day in the future, if the, when the community has accepted EGSphere more, that we switch to 100% EGSphere. And then it becomes really easy because then it's in, in some years from now, it's very clear to everybody that when you submit to EGU journals, you have your preprint on EGSphere, and then you might have your journal paper on the, uh, on the journal's website. Um, so now it might be that this preprint, um, during the public peer review, it turns out that it's, it's might, it might not be feasible for a consideration for ACP. And it might be that after the discussion, the editors say to the authors that they, uh, they cannot consider this preprint. Then the relation to ACP is released. And it means from that moment on, ACP is no longer interested in this EGSphere preprint. However, the preprint itself is primarily, primarily an EGSphere preprint. So it will remain forever in the, in the library of EGSphere. If it comes to a final journal publication. We cannot yet show you an example because we're simply not in that stage. The good thing is that ACP for sure lists the paper as Barbara said, because it then is a final journal article with a citation of ACP, of course. But at the same time, of course, the preprint is still with its bibliographic record on EGSphere. And of course, since it is the same system, we link from the EGSphere preprint to the final journal publication in ACP. And now another um, feature here is also, Susanna mentioned this, our collaboration with ESOR, with Earth Archive, with archive.org. It's not only that we allow their uh, preprint posters to seek a public peer review on EGSphere, but it's also, for example, that if authors announce that they have an EGSphere preprint without a journal relation to an EGU journal, or maybe they tested it, but it didn't went out. Later on, they are published at different journals, at Springer or Elsevier, 
we can still link it. So the idea is that we say on EG Sphere, it's, it's really a preprint server. It's not that it is meant to be the preprint stage of the journals. So we are happy to add this information, and then you can find on your EG Sphere preprint also linked to your final journal article, the related uh, corresponding final journal article, maybe on Springer or so. Um, so these are the main features of, of EG Sphere. Um, and uh, one thing to add, uh, we talked already about um, the topics which you can which you can find here. So please uh, feel invited to have a look on your own, because it's very interesting, especially for preprints without journal relation. You will see that we have some topics here which are really at the edge of the scopes of EGU's journals. And so far, EGU has no journals in this, uh, in this regard, maybe. But of course, EGU is happy to welcome your preprints on such topics. Another important um, part is that you can look who, is, who are the preprint moderators. Because if you have a preprint on EGU sphere with a journal relation, it's clear. You're seeking for a full peer review by journal editors. And then you find all information on the individual journal websites. Whereas if you have a preprint without a journal relation, we are not immediately targeting journal publication, then we have what we said, this initial screening by the preprint moderators. And that's a really nice initiative because the, um, being a preprint moderator um, is not only um, a rewarding thing where you are, uh, where, where you're working with brand new signs, maybe even so new that it's not yet in a format where you want to submit it to a journal, but you want to bring the idea out, as Susanne said. But the good thing that it is also a very nice starting point for early career scientists to get involved. Even if you are maybe not accepted or you, are, you, feel not, um, you feel yourself not ready for being an editorial board member of a well-prestigious journal, start with just sphere moderators. We have clear uh, screening guidelines. You can see here how the screening works and what we are looking for. Um, you have with Susanne an excellent coordinator to help you. And this can also be a chance for early career scientists um, to um, to get involved in the business of um, peer reviewing as such. Becoming an EGSphere moderator is also relatively easy. Um, on the landing page of EGSphere, we have linked this form. Here you can apply to become an EGSphere moderator. Uh, you give some of your, of your affiliation. Um, we ask you for motivation, why you apply. You select your expertise from the same topic list as we have seen before. And we ask for your CV to upload um, up your, to your CV in a PDF format. And then we ask for two things. We ask for a reference that can be your PhD supervisor or a established colleague supporting your application. And we ask for, for an endorsement from EGU. And there we have EGU council members or executive editors from EGU's journals who should endorse you. So the idea is in principle when a moderator comes, um, we have a reference, we have an endorser. Both the endorser and the reference are asked to review your application and to give us their feedback. Ideally, of course, they support your application. And then it's the board of EGSphere, which is Barbara as PubCom ch um, chair of the publications committee for you, Susanne as EGSphere coordinator, and uh, the other executive and chief editors of EGS journals who can review the applications and accept them for final implementation. And uh, this is something where we, can, where we kindly ask the community to uh, think about applying, um, since we cannot have enough moderators, of course, and we still have some topics left on EGSphere where we have no moderators yet. Um, and this is, of course, uh, something we, a gap we want to, we want to close. Yeah, maybe uh, so far um, regarding the preprints. Then Susanne also said that we have this other seg segment here. You have seen that under about, we have some general things like FAQs, like topics. They are for both worlds, let's say, meetings and publications. Now I talked a lot about preprints, which is more, let's say, the EGU uh, publication side. Regarding the conferences, um, what you will see here and that is a bit different because we had from Marie-France Loutre also the question, what is about the abstracts? Can there be any abstract? 
I have to answer no, um, because different from the preprints where we say, well, as long as you are within the scope of Aegisphere and you can select one or more of the Aegisphere topics, we are happy to welcome you, even if you are originally maybe not, not uh, as such an EGU community member. Maybe you, you learn about EGU for the first time. Whereas for the conferences, um, EGUSphere is the repository for EGUS conferences. Um, all of you hopefully knows the General Assembly, this annual very large conference of EGU. But there are other conferences. We have the Alexander von Humboldt conference series. We have the Plinius conference series on Mediterranean risks. Um, we have the Galileo series of specific uh, smaller uh, topical conferences. And whenever they organize their AppSec submission and, um, and session organizations through our system, we also call us them here. As Susanne said, before 2020, we, had, uh, we have not um, assigned DOIs. So these abstracts are linked. Um, like for example, if you look into uh, Plinius, um, then you see here uh, different abstracts and you can filter by oral or posters. Um, and then they might have even um, display materials uploaded. Um, whereas if you go to conferences from 2020 on, at the moment you only see his general assemblies, but don't worry, you will see even there further conferences. It's simply that the smaller conferences um, weren't able to transform the conference into a virtual format. So therefore, due to the pandemic, they had, a, had, had to pause. But from 2022 on, you will see that there will come up many more conferences. And then here, if you go into something, let's select a small, smaller program group so that it does not take too long. Um, you have abstracts, you have abstracts with display materials or even abstracts with commented display materials where you had a full discussion on the abstract presentation material. And then you can, you can watch them, um, you can learn about the abstracts and so on. So I really invite you to take a look on EGSphere and to find out about the abstracts and presentations about the preprints and the options. And maybe we will see you again as a preprint moderator on EGSphere. We look forward to this. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Martin, Barbara, and Susanna. Um, now we'll move on to the Q&A section of the webinar. Um, we've had a couple of uh, questions popped in the Q&A box. Um, I think a few are a few clarifications on what's already been spoken. I think Martin, you might have mentioned these topics forever already. But to re-clarify, could you just um, answer whether a paper can remain forever on each of sphere without being submitted to a journal and uh, whether it's possible to register a paper in each sphere only and later move it to a journal? Yes. Um, should I, Susanna, or would you like to? Oh, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so regarding the first question, Marie-France, um, so, um, indeed, yes, um, a paper remains forever on Aegisphere. That's, by the way, also something um, um, we, had, uh, we had also criticism in the past that EGU is keeping everything online and documented, even if it is rejected. Um, and this is, this is part of the EGU and Copernicus shared um, open access policy. Um, so, therefore, if you have a preprint and Whatever you suggested, so either you went immediately without a journal relation or you had a journal relation first, but you might not be accepted in the journal, so you, you, you lose your journal relation. As long as you are posted on Aegisphere, you have the bibliographic record of Aegisphere, you will remain there. And, um, and, and, but uh, people will not find out that you have uh, um, submitted also to an EGU journal or to any other journal. For, for another publisher. And regarding the second question, um, yes, indeed, um, that is, uh, that is uh, in this, in this uh, graph um, Barbara showed. Um, besides the three main roads, we have some nice additional features. There are two big ones. The one is what you exactly described, namely, first, I, let's say I, I didn't feel encouraged to submit with a journal relation because it was first an idea. And I submitted to Aegisphere as a standalone preprint. It is uh, screened by a moderator, accepted, posted online, people discuss it. 
And during the discussion, I get some nice insights, and then I feel encouraged to submit it to an EGU journal. And that's exactly what I can do during the discussion or after the discussion. So at the end of the discussion time of six months on EGSphere, if you have no journal relation, uh, we ask the authors, your regular discussion time is over. Um, you have now two options. Either you simply let uh, the discussion be archived and that's it, or you um, reconsider um, having a relation to an EGU journal. And then it's the EGU journal's editors being called asking, hey, do you think this preprint, this standalone preprint, so far only screened, is eligible for your journal, yes or no? And if yes, the public peer review on the journal starts again. And the other nice feature is um, if you submit with a journal relation and the journal editor is called and they found that your preprint is not yet eligible for full journal peer review, they can downgrade your preprint in a way that they, that they say to you, okay, we have two options. Either I reject it or we um, transform it into a standalone preprint. So even there, authors have different options. Thank you for your answer, Martin. Um, we have two more questions just come in. Um, the first is, how much time does the moderator have for accepting and rejecting the preprints? Uh, who wants to answer that one? Yeah, Susanna. Take that one. Oh, Susanna? No, Barbara can take that oh, okay. one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, it's actually very fast. So um, we hope um, that um, the, the preprint moderators pick up um, the submitted preprints within one day. So the calls are organized such that in the first day, um, the preprint moderators that match the topics um, are called. If no one responds um, of these moderators, then the moderate, um, all moderators are called. And um, if then within Again, within one day, no moderator picks up the preprint, then the EGU sphere um, coordinator, so Susanna um, steps in and contacts the moderators and asks them to um, pick up this preprint. So basically, um, we want to have a very, very quick turnaround time that the preprints are posted within a couple of days or three days. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Um, we have another question, um, which is, are ECS welcome as moderators? Uh, Susanna, do you want to take that one? Oh, absolutely. So definitely early career scientists <laughs> welcome as moderators. We, we would love to have you on board. Um, th there is no, um, there's not any um, restriction in, in the sense of, of career stage. And when you go to the preprint moderator page, um, you will see that many people are early career scientists, um, but also, um, I appear there too. I'm definitely not identifying as an early career scientist. Um, so, so we we aim for um, for, for a diverse um, distribution you know, background of, of our moderators. Um, the, the only thing we ask is um, as a moderator is that you have affinity with the open access publication process, so that you subscribe to to the whole idea of preprint posting. Um, and that you have some experience um, with, with reviewing publishing. Um, that, that doesn't mean editor experience, but you know, it would be lovely if you have actually submitted a paper and, and, and that you have reviewed a paper. Um, that, that's it really. So you, we ask for endorsement. It's all clear when you follow the, the form. It, it's really not, not a lot. Um, and we're, we're really looking for some more moderator applications. Um, as Martin said, we have a few gaps. Um, but yeah, so I'd say the more the better. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. Excellent. Uh, thanks for clarifying. So I, I guess the takeaway from that is if you're not sure about the experience um, you have, um, as long as you've engaged in the publication process at some point, be it submitting or reviewing, um, and have some understanding of what open access is, then you should feel free to apply to be a moderator. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for now. And I think that's a, a good time to end the webinar. So and then I'd like to thank all the attendees for uh, coming and joining us today. And I'd like to again thank our speakers, Barbara, Martin and Suzanne for all the information you've given. So yes, thank you very much. Uh, this webinar will be available on YouTube next week. Um, and thanks again.
Bye-bye.